sorry, I'm smirking because my air conditioning went out in my car and uh, I can't <laughs> record these podcasts with the windows down because nobody would be able to hear me. So if I start sweating like crazy, you uh, put something funny in the comments. I don't know. All right. I'm hoping this window here doesn't make you guys all dizzy. We'll see them. All right. So I want to um, talk about something that I, I, I've recorded a number of podcasts on, but they haven't been published yet and won't publish at least for a few weeks. And that is the Franciscan School of Theology. I think that's a, it's a really important facet of Western Catholic theology. Now, for those of you who don't know, just to give some introduction, um, the Catholic Church is divided into two main groups, and it would be Eastern Catholics, so those under, say, the the Ukrainian Catholic Church or the Byzant the uh, not Byzantine Catholic Church, but the uh, the Melkite Catholic Church or the Cyril Malabar Catholic Church. Cyril Malabar are uh, based out of India. There's also the Cyril Malankar based out of India. So th those are just a few of the Eastern Catholic churches. There are, to my knowledge, 23 Catholic Eastern Catholic churches, and then there is one Western Catholic Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, so, so the Eastern Catholic Church has its own different kind of schools of theology, I guess you could say, mostly um, basing themselves from various saints of some sort, um, like uh, St. John Damascene or St. Maximus the Confessor. Um, th there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, St. Uh, Gregory Palamas, who, to my knowledge, is actually a canonized saint in the Catholic Church, although he was Orthodox. Um, and when the Eastern Catholics, when, when a lot more of them started coming into union with the, the Bishop of Rome, the, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, gave basically an, an allowance for Gregory Palamas to be honored in Eastern Catholic liturgies, which is pretty much a de facto canonization of him. I mean, the whole word canonization means that he's, his name is in the canon, the, the, what is read at Mass. The, a canon is, is the book, basically, that, that, that is read at Mass. Um, or it's, it's one of the prayers that's read at Mass. So, so he, he has been canonized, at least in the Eastern Catholic Churches, but de facto that means he's also canonized in the Western Catholic Church. I mean, if you're taking it to his logical conclusion, basically. So why am I saying all this? So there's the Eastern Catholic Church, and then there's the Western Catholic Church. The Western Catholic Church is quite a lot bigger. Most people don't even know about the Eastern Catholic Churches, which is a travesty. It's, it's not good. Uh, we need to get that information out there for people, because it's, it's very important. And there are a lot of people that convert to the Catholic Church who I think would find Eastern Catholic Churches much more um, agreeable to them. A lot of Protestants, I think, might find their uh, spirituality and their liturgy a lot more agreeable. And then obviously any Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox who convert to the Catholic Church would, would feel much more comfortable in an Eastern Catholic Church than in a Western Roman Catholic Church. Because the, the Eastern Catholic Churches are basically Orthodox in union with Rome. Some of them don't like that title, but but a lot of them do. Anyway, so the church is divided into these two main groups, basically. And uh, just another fact about this, each of the 23 or so Eastern Catholic churches is its own juridical entity, basically, within the universal Catholic church. So they, uh, they have their own code of canon law. They have... Uh, their own patriarchs, basically, who, who, who oversee the running of that church. Um, so the, and, the, and then they're divided up into various eparchies, which is the eastern version of a diocese, uh, is, is a, a good way to put it. It's basically Greek for, actually, I'm forgetting the literal Greek there. I think it's Greek for district or something, or community, something like that. Anyway, so the Catholic Church is divided into these two different main groups, east and west. And they're all under 
uh, the Pope, the Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome. Or I guess not under him, but they're uh, in communion with him is the proper terminology. I had a an Eastern Catholic friend of mine who's uh, in seminary to become an Eastern Catholic priest. Uh, correct me on that recently. He, he said, no, don't use the word under because they're not like... They're not like under the Pope, they're in communion with him. It's just a it, it different emphasis, basically, but an important emphasis nonetheless. So in all that to say is within each of those groups, East and West, there are different than schools of theology among them, different ways of looking at various bits of theology and also philosophy um, for that matter. So like I said, within the Eastern Catholic Church, a lot of them stem from various Eastern uh, saints, mostly church fathers. Uh, now. Gregory Palamas is not really a church father. He's more of a middle medieval, a medieval scholar, you could say, and saint. But then the Western Catholic Church, most of the schools of theology, um, the, the earliest really is basing itself off of St. Augustine, who lived in the 300s. Um, but then you, you could probably say that the Benedictines have their own school of theology, although it's not generally very distinct. And then you could also say, you know, the Carmelites have their own spirituality. A lot of it is divided into various religious orders. So Benedictines, Carmelites, Dominicans, Franciscans, uh, and Jesuits are the big ones. And probably the biggest three out of those are uh, the Augustinians, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Jesuits. The, the Carmelites kind of have their own school of theology, although that's more of a, of a spiritual theology based off of St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. And also a little bit of St. Simon Stock as well. So the, the, again, the Western Catholic Church has this these divisions in it of different schools of theology based upon various saints and usually based upon religious orders. And um, I, I think it's very important that people know this because um, it was actually during the late 1800s and then throughout the, the 1900s, the, the 20th century, and up until today, the Dominican school of theology, and particularly the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, has been the dominant school of thought within the Roman Catholic Church, within the Western Church. So, and a lot of people, you know, that, that's all that they hear about ever, is the, the school of St. Thomas Aquinas and subsequent Dominicans. And I think that's good to, to a certain extent because uh, St. Thomas is very, very clear. He's very systematic. Um, he, you know, the, the Summa Theologica is question and answer based, and it's pretty easy to look stuff up if you need things. It's very much like a catechism. And not that other schools don't have this, but I think particularly St. Thomas's writings are probably the clearest and the most systematic, and so thus they're the easiest to disseminate uh, to to the laity, and and they're the the clearest to explain. There's there's uh, yeah, I, I guess that's all that I would say about it. it is is that. that that that's I think in large part why it has become the main school of thought within the Western Catholic Church. And but I do think there's a revival going on. There, there is a revival going on, and, and particularly a revival of the Franciscan school of theology, which is uh, the school of theology which I am very much, I, I very much have a, a, a kindred spirit with. Um, I was a Franciscan for four years of my life, discerning with a Franciscan community here in Indiana, and, and uh, I, I learned a lot about, particularly about St. Bonaventure during that time, who is the first besides St. Francis, um, the first main, uh, mainly like still popular today, <laughs> theologian of the Franciscan school. There's also St. Anthony of Padua, who did write a lot um, and, and does predate St. Bonaventure, but a lot of people don't actually read his writings <laughs> very much, and, and I actually haven't read any of his writings. Um, he's, he's a very popular saint in like, in like Catholic culture, but people don't necessarily read his writings very often as uh, theology. I, I would like to do that at some point. I just haven't really gotten to it. The main two I've been focusing on are St. Bonaventure and then Blessed John Don Scotus, who I'll talk about in a second. But St. Bonaventure lived uh, during the, the 1200s. Uh, he was born, I think, in 
12 teens or 12 20s right around he, he was his his early childhood was coincident with the life of saint francis and saint francis actually it's um saint francis actually healed him if I'm, my memory is serving me correctly healed him when he was a child of an ailment um, and actually gave him the name bonaventure which he later took as his religious name when he joined the franciscans so yeah he uh, he he really became the first the popularized theologian amongst the franciscans uh, and and his his thought is very it's very based in augustine saint augustine so it's very augustinian although it has a lot of things that are unique to him and then because he's based in augustine he's also very based on uh, the philosophy of Plato and particularly the Neoplatonists like Plotinus and Plutarch and many others. Uh, and, and that's because Augustine was very much based in them as well. Um, Bonaventure also gives a lot of reference to Boethius, who was also very influenced by the Neoplatonists. Uh, Boethius was a 6th century Catholic ca Catholic uh, theologian very or philosopher, really. Very influential. And yeah, so, so Bonaventure has a very distinct way of writing and way of doing theology. It's very fluid, you could say. It's not as systematized as uh, the thought of, of Aquinas or Blessed John John Scotus, whom I'll get to in a second. Um, it's not as systematized. It's not as question and answer based, you could say. Um, it's more it's more fluid. It's more... He's much easier to read. He's not as chunky, I guess, or clunky. So, yeah, I, I think if people want to start in the Franciscan school of theology, I would start with St. Bonaventure, and I would particularly start either with, with one of three different works of his, three different works, and that would be the Breviloquium of St. Bonaventure, which is basically his catechism, and I'm hoping to do some videos on that here soon. Um, it's basically his, his catechism. He goes through like a summary of the Catholic faith. It's about 300 pages. Still pretty, it's not like a walk in the park, but it's a lot easier than Aquinas or Scotus to, to get through. And then, and then... I would start with two other of his works, which are more works of, of spiritual theology. And the first would be his uh, Journey of the Mind into God, or his uh, in Latin it's called the Itinerarium, which means journey in Latin. And also his, excuse me, his, uh, his Triple Way, which gives a lot, a little bit more of a systematized view of his spiritual theology. And it's, it's, both of those works are very beautiful. They're very beautiful. And they're shorter. They're pretty short. I think the itinerarium is like 20 or 30 pages, and the triple way is like 70 or 80. And then, uh, and then you have Blessed John Duns Scotus, who uh, in the in the tradition of the church is known as the Doctor Subtilis or the subtle doctor, the subtle doctor. Uh, Saint Bonaventure is known as the Doctor Seraphicus, the seraphic doctor. And then Saint Aqu Thomas Aquinas, for example, is the Dr. Angelicus, the angelic doctor. So he, yes, Blessed John Duns Scotus, um, he, he's much harder to read than both Bonaventure and Aquinas, in, in my opinion. He's much harder to read than both of them. Uh, he makes tons of distinctions, <laughs> which is why he's called the subtle doctor. And he's he's very, very Aristotelian in his thought. Like, like I really think somebody would need to read most of Aristotle to even understand what he says like 85% of the time. <laughs> I haven't read all of his works yet. I'm, I'm working through them, but that's basically the general sense that I get. Like I have a, I have a really hard time understanding them and I've read a lot of, uh, of uh, Aristotle. So anyway, geez, I'm like, I'm sweating. It's hot. Um, so I think I'm going to continue this later. I'll talk a little bit more about Blessed John Duns Scotus and his thought and where we can find his works and things like that. So, uh, all right, let's pick this up uh, in, in next time.